I want to welcome each and every one of us to, to this conversation um, themed Silencing the Guns in Africa, Transforming Youth Exclusionary Realities uh, into Peace Dividends. On behalf of Building Blocks for Peace Foundation Nigeria, I want to appreciate all our distinguished speakers who have joined us from across uh, the world. In particular, I want to thank Graham Simpson, uh, who is the senior representative at Interpeace, and of course, uh, the lead author for the Independent Progress Study on Youth Peace and Security. Um, I also want to thank particularly Achaleke Christen, uh, who is the national coordinator, local youth corner Cameroon, for also joining this uh, joining this conversation. And I also want to thank Dr. Rooks Ako, who is a senior analyst at the African Union Commission, and of course, one of the leading brains behind the African Union Youth Peace and Security Africa's program. So I welcome all three speakers. Thank you for joining this conversation. We do not take your particip participation uh, for granted. I also want to thank all our colleagues who have joined from across the world. I can see UNOI's representative here. Um, I can see, I mean, uh, great, great, great uh, peace builders also in this call. I can see our colleagues from CMI. Uh, thank you all for, for joining. We do not take um, your participation for granted. Um, to start with, I would like to say that for those of you who do not already know, uh, Building Blocks for Peace Foundation is a youth non-governmental organization that is working on conflict prevention, peace building, and sustainable development uh, here in Nigeria. Our theory of change is to achieve sustainable peace and development through peace education, uh, research and documentation, radio and TV programming, capacity building, sports, arts, um, etc. The organization was formed in 2016, and since then, we've been trying our best to ensure that we contribute our quota to sustainable peace and development um, in Nigeria. The essence of this conversation today is to uh, see how to bridge the gap between what is happening globally on youth peace and security and our own local realities as peace builders uh, in Africa. We have designed this um, webinar specifically to uh, see how to raise awareness about the existing uh, frameworks globally and of course uh, in Africa. You recall that the United Nations recently added another resolution to, I mean, the interesting existing resolutions that we have. Now we have resolution 2250, we have resolution 2419, and now the new resolution 2535. Um, the African Union is also not relenting, especially with the adoption of um, the African Union Continental Framework on Youth Peace and Security. So we felt that it was important for us to create some kind of platform where we can, I mean, uh, merge all this existing framework, raise awareness about them, and shape conversation around youth peace and security uh, in Africa. We have also created this platform to also see how to uh, connect experts on peace and security, on youth peace and security with local peace builders uh, on the continent. So it's on that note that we felt that it was important for us to create this kind of conversation uh, continentally so that we can all benefit, benefit from it. Today, we are gonna to be looking at something uh, very unique Last week, uh, about um, two, three weeks ago, we had the first edition uh, where we looked at the complementarity between the newly um, adopted UN Security Council Resolution 2535 and then um, the African Union uh, Continental Framework on Youth Peace and Security. For participants who attended, they can testify that it was, I mean, a very interesting session. We had Saji Prelis uh, from the Global Coalition on Youth Peace and Security. We had Mohamed Foboy from UNOI. And we had Mafreke Upana from the African Union Commission. It was an interesting session. So today, uh, we're going to be taking that conversation further uh, as we look at the team again, silencing the guns in Africa, transforming uh, youth exclusionary realities into peace uh, dividends. And um, to take that presentation, uh, the three amazing speakers uh, in our midst today, in no particular order, I'm going to be calling on themselves, calling on them to uh, briefly introduce themselves. And to start with, I call on uh, Graham Simpson to please kindly introduce himself briefly. Um, hello, all. Uh, thank you so much, and to Bulling Box Peace Foundation. It's a it's a real honor and a privilege to be here, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. My name is Graham Simpson. I'm South African by origin, living and working at the moment in New York City. Um, I'm the 
principal representative and senior peace building advisor for Interpeace, which is a, a global peace building organization, um, and historically played the role of the lead author um, on the progress study on youth peace and security, the missing peace. All right, thank you very much, Graham. I sincerely appreciate Graham for joining us because I, I want to say it again that it's 6 a.m. in New York and we had to bring Graham up very early. So Graham, we appreciate your presence, thank you. So um, Dr. Rooks, can you please introduce yourself briefly? Uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Uh, good morning to those still in the morning uh, time. My name is uh, Rooks Ako. I'm a senior analyst with the Conflict Prevention and Early Warning Division at the African Union Commission in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. I also co-convene the uh, Youth for Peace Africa program, which is the African Union's uh, program initiated to ensure that uh, young peace builders uh, like yourselves uh, are fully uh, mainstreamed into the activities and the agenda of uh, the union with regards to uh, peace and security. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Rooks, for joining us. Um, Achaleke, can you please introduce yourself? Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. My name is uh, Christian Achaleke, and I'm from the Republic of Cameroon. I serve as the national coordinator of Local Youth Corner Cameroon, uh, which is a youth-led peace building organization and uh, we've been working for the past 18 years now. And um, our response around Boko Haram, around different forms of conflict in Cameroon. And I have a background in, in research as well as in the activism space. I also serve as the pan Common World Coordinator of the Common World Youth Peace Ambassadors Network, which brings together over uh, 1,000 youth-led organizations across the Commonwealth to reflect around uh, peace and security and preventing violent extremism. And uh, so thank you very much for, for this meeting and I hope that we could, you know, uh, share a lot. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Achaleke. I like the way you, I mean, humbly introduce yourself. Achaleke is a multiple award-winning activist. He has won almost all the awards existing on the continent. There is nothing for us to, I mean, to vie for again. So thank you very much, Achaleke. It's on that note that, I uh, would like to go straight into the uh, conversation proper. And um, I want to bring back again to our speakers that the essence of having this conversation is to see how to strike a balance between what is happening globally and of course um, on the continent. So let's have that um, at, the back, at the back of our mind. So it's on that note that I would like to um, ask Achaleke to begin to prepare as we look into the first team, uh, which is um, Youth Building Peace. Um, So, can you hear me? Can you still hear me? Yes, I can still hear you. So, I, I was trying to move to a place which is uh, more quiet. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, um, I want to quickly provide some kind of brief background before Achaleke, I mean, delve fully into um, his presentation. Um, the United Nations has, has, has done so much for us with the adoption of, I mean, Resolution 2250, Resolution 2419, Resolution 2535. Uh, which all boils down to uh, I mean, recognizing the significant contributions of young people to peace and security, which we never had uh, prior to 2000 and 2015. Uh, December 2015, the UN adopted the first resolution on youth peace and security, which young peace builders all over the world are now using to, I mean, strengthening uh, the entire architecture and enhancing their participation in peace, uh, in peace and security. Africa, of course, uh, remains uh, the center stage for conflicts all, all over the world. It was in recognition of this that the African Union deemed fit um, as part of its agenda 2063 uh, to ensure that the silence, I mean, the guns in Africa uh, before 2020. Unfortunately, uh, we're in 2020 now. Uh, so today we're gonna to be looking at how the role that young people can play um, in the silencing the guns campaign um, in Africa. But of course, we must also recognize that there are a lot of barriers, a lot of obstacles uh, to young people's participation in peace and security processes. So these are some of the things that we're going to be highlighting and of course, providing recommendations uh, for transforming all this into peace dividends. So I want to call on Achaleke first to please provide an overview of how young people are building peace um, in Africa. So Achaleke, you will do that in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. 
Um, thank you very much. And uh, I mean, this is a conversation which I, I find very interesting uh, because in my, in my work for 14 years today, uh, growing as a volunteer and also leading an organization to becoming a leader, um, you know, I've had the opportunity to either work in other parts of Africa or interacting with my peers who are doing really amazing work. Uh, but I would like to say all of this is possible. When I look back in 2007, when I started this work, and today there has really been an, an increase in young people who are engaging, uh, working around peace building. Uh, there's a really change in perception when it comes to government and different stakeholders. And I think I want to start by applauding uh, the role of, you know, international organizations in making this happen. Um, you know, the role of the African Union, because in, in 2006, when the African Union Charter really highlighted young people in this light as peace builders, it, it was the beginning of a new conversation uh, 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 globally. Uh, because for a long time, we have been seeing young people as troublemakers. I'm saying so because I grew up with a very troubled uh, childhood, you know, knowing what violence means and, and knowing what gun can do and knowing what, you know, uh, how, what it means for someone to be stabbed or burnt alive. And, you know, when I look back then and, and today, I feel that there's a real big shift. I'm talking now very practically at what we see on the field. You know, young people are changing a lot even the ones who are not in civil society even the ones who used to carry arms you know uh, are really looking at things differently and this is thanks to you know instruments which have been put in place by the international community you know uh, starting from the au uh, uh, charter which looked at young people because at some point uh, one of the reasons why uh, young people involved in conflict is because also their value uh, you know to community and to the world is not being highlighted it's not been appreciated so you know every effort which has been done including un security council resolutions and policy papers and you know uh, international organizations who have been providing capacity building opportunities for young people to network i would want to hold you know uh, them for this success that they have played a key role and you know grime is there and he led an amazing research i want to say thank you because you know it is thanks to the fact that we've been able to showcase you know what young people are doing that we are it's inspiring many more young people when it comes to recognizing young peace builders it was not the case before you know and uh, you know when you know awards program you know training programs these really really provided us with the capacity you know i'm going to capacity which is the first thing i've talked about the safe space which started in 2006 and even before uh you know policy documents international organizations making it possible the second thing is capacity training when i look at my life as a person as a peace builder that has worked extensively worked at the front line I feel that I could only do that because, you know, I was given the capacity, training, workshop, networking, you know, these things really, really build. Because with policy existing without capacity, you will not be able to deliver, you know. Another very important thing, which is helping young people in Africa to do this work is the issue of mentorship, you know, uh, because we've seen a whole bigger conversation where mentorship has gone beyond borders, where we have mentors from Asia, from Europe, from the United States, from different parts, sharing these ideas together. And I think all of this is working uh, because we are looking at new peace and security, not just from a Pan-African perspective, not, not, not just from an Asian perspective, not just from European perspective, but as a global movement that young people have to work together, have to collaborate. Now, with these favorable uh, things happening, which I would not say is 100%, but I think it's a good start, and that's why we're having this kind of result. I would like to share with you how young people are building peace in the continent. You know, the first thing which young people have been demonstrating most recently is the whole issue around mobilizing themselves onto social movements. You know, mobilizing themselves into social movement, how, why? Because we came to understand that for us to effectively build peace, we need to also replicate some of the key peace building, you know, values, which is collaboration, which is working together, which is, you know, crafting our ideas and looking for a single way to push it out. And I take, for example, building blocks, which came up in 2016, 
came as a result of collaboration, different, people's, different people coming together to work. I mean, this is one thing which has been so reoccurring. Young people are forming social movements from different walks of life, looking at how they can respond to peace from different angles. And that is why with the outbreak of the pandemic, young peace builders did not sit and wait. Young peace builders looked at the pandemic, looked at how the pandemic, COVID pandemic was influencing peace and security and using innovation and bringing people from different walks of life to be able to respond to the pandemic in a way where it would continue to build peace and security within the continent. I mean, this is a clear example of how young people are doing it and they are championing this. Another thing it's around a peer-to-peer -peer engagement, which is another key way in which young people are building peace in the continent. Increasingly, we are seeing a situation where there's a kind of peer-to-peer you know, mentorship and collaboration and engagement where even in design of peace building initiative, young people work with their peers, which is still collaboration. But what is still very interesting is the age group. If we look at African continent, 50 to 35, as time goes on, the collaboration is really, really increasing where young people who are even 20 are, you know, working with their peers who are 21, 22, 23. So the pair-to-pair -pair kind of approach of delivering peace is very important to an extent where we see young people to the media DDR. I mean, I saw that in Cameroon, a young person who is caught at, in the middle of the separatist fighters in the English speaking region. He has been working extensively to mediate, you know, the disengagement, the disarmament of these young people because he is a young person and understands the reality which people are facing and what pushes them to conflict and violence. And this peer-to-peer -peer approach has really contributed extensively towards you know, building peace. Another thing which is very evident is how young people are creating a safe space for themselves. You know, the time has come when we don't have to wait for our governments to give us opportunity, where we have to wait for our governments to give us the funding or wait for our governments to give us policy. Continuously, young people in the continent are creating their own spaces and today government is following. I take, for example, in Cameroon, in our context, we have the conflict which we are facing from the far north, the northwest and the southwest, which is a big issue. We've been talking about mediation. There was never a day or there's never been a day where the government has called for young people to reflect on how they can contribute in the mediation process, in the peace process, for example. But we mobilize ourselves as young people to organize the first national symposium on youth participation in peace processes. And as an outcome of it, we proposed and we were able to come up with the first group of young mediators who are working at the front line and are making things work. Now, if we waited for this opportunity to be given to us, it would never have happened or it would have happened with a lot of misconceptions. But we created this part and today as we speak, the Cameroon government is 100% in support of this uh, network just like the UN system as well, that is supporting this network. This is also an example of how young people are, you know, creating their own spaces in the continent. And if you go to Nigeria, it's the same thing. We are seeing evidence of how new networks are sprouting up without the support of government or whatsoever. But when these networks, you know, are able to have success to demonstrate that they can start a process we see governments following, we see UN agencies following, we see I mean, this is very important because young peace builders, their biggest challenge is their protection. And that's why when the new UN Security Council resolution was adopted, I felt so elated because on the front line, there's a lot of threats. You, you, can amount, you, can, you cannot imagine the amount of threats that personally I do have and, you know, the kind of ransom which would be placed on me if I'm kidnapped or whatsoever, you know. But for us to be able to sustainably build peace, you know, continuously we are seeing young people respecting the rule of law. Even when we want to protest, even when we want to retaliate, even when we want to advocate, we ensure that we are respecting human rights at the same time, we are respecting the rule of law at the same time, and we are trying our best to be solution providers. 
not just critics, but looking at the challenges and looking at how we can provide solutions. And this has really, really worked. And it's inspired many people and even governments to understand that young people are not coming to fight with them. It's not a, an issue of fighting with generation, but it's an issue of understanding the realities, respecting the rules and the laws and being very civic and doing it as an effort of patriotism and doing it as an effort for Pan-Africanism. You know, this is another clear example of how young people are building peace because peace building starts from within. And by the time you are peaceful from within, you will be able to see how to get things done and do it the right way. And to, to run up with is around capacity building and training. Continuously, young people across the continent are building peace through providing capacity to themselves, to beneficiary communities. And continuously, we've seen how they have been at the front line around training. Maybe IDPs at the front line training refugees, at the front line even working with prisoners, violent offenders, extremist offenders. Now, this is growing as the time goes on because these efforts which young people are doing are being also recognized by their PAS and also by their governments and also by the international community. And that's why I would like to round up to say that the African Union should not uh, 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 rest. They should keep you know, working towards building a favorable space you know, today we see a uh, uh, new uh, continental, uh, you know, report around young people and peace building. We need more of this. We need it in. Hello? Hello, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I guess we lost Achaleke's, um, Achaleke's connection. Um, as soon as he's back, we'll, I mean, also connect with him. Um, it's on that note that I want to uh, bring on board uh, Dr. Rooks Akko to kindly uh, take us through the African Union Silencing the Guns campaign how the African Union intends to achieve this? What are the, I mean, processes? What are the uh, things already involved? I know that there's a lot of noise, especially by the African Union envoy on youth uh, at Achebe, trying to mobilize young people uh, behind this interesting, this, this, this interesting uh, campaign. Unfortunately, uh, the, the Silas and the Guns campaign was supposed to be achieved. Uh, by, by 2020, and we're already in 2020. So I wouldn't know what the African Union is planning, whether it's, 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 it's going to extend this uh, or not. So I want to hand over to uh, Dr. Rooks now to quickly take us through the Silence in the Guns campaign and the role that young people can play um, in the achievement of this campaign. Dr. Rooks, you have the floor in 10 minutes. Uh, thank you so much. And um, I think uh, listening to uh, Christian as he spoke, I think in a sense he's um, provided some answers to the question you pose uh, to me. Nonetheless, I will go ahead by telling um, our listeners that the Silence in the Guns campaign itself is not... Um, something that stands alone. It's, it's part of a bigger uh, purpose, um, the Agenda 2063. And Agenda 2063 itself has uh, 15 priority uh, uh, projects, if I can say it that way. And one of them, of course, uh, that is hot right now is the AFCFTA. I literally just got off uh, another uh, webinar talking to uh, youth on, on that with the with the with the Putana, uh, session, uh, but what 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 is silencing the guns really? I mean, I think this is, um, and I'm not going to be formalistic and normative in my approach. I just want to say it simple so that everyone out there can have a uh, very good work in understanding of what it is. Silencing the guns as an initiative is simply um, a process by which um, the root causes of conflict are addressed on the continent. And this, of course, includes 
um, addressing ongoing conflict. So it's not a, a situation where I've had in many spaces where people think it's about simply ending wars, that is literally silencing um, guns. Rather, it's about a process wherein the root causes of uh, conflict are addressed. And what are the root causes of conflict? Across the continent, I think they're, they're, they're the same. I mean, uh, I guess I guess we lost uh, Dr. Rook's connection. Dr. Rooks, can you hear us? I think I lost connection. Okay. Hello. Okay, you're back. Great. Okay, yes. Great. Please speak on. So, I mean, it's 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 those issues that I think are um, similar across uh, the continent. So silencing the guns as an initiative um, was to come together and follow a process wherein we can address the root causes of conflict. And yes, you're right, we're in 2020. Um, but um, earlier, late last year, early this year, I think to answer that question, um, yes, it's been, the, the, it's been moved, so to speak, because what this year as the theme of the year for the African Union, what the union is doing is assessing, you know, the journey till date and trying to figure out what those challenges are, what are those things that still need to be done, what are the things that need to be tweaked, what are the things that need to be brought on board, you know, and then take it uh, forward. And I think something that is really critical is, um, is the um, EFCFTA. And I'm using this opportunity to talk to young people everywhere that that is an initiative that doesn't need your government giving anything to you. That's a policy framework within which youth are recognized as primary drivers because it's a process wherein digitalization is the way. And I think young people are ingenious, young people are resilient and young people are innovative. I think these three characteristics of young people put them firmly in the driving seat to take advantage of uh, the AFCFTA and uh, make progress. And why do I refer to that? I say that because if, you, if we listen to 10 speakers, I'm sure nine of 10 would probably refer to lack of economic opportunities or economic sustenance as the underlying factor of youth engaging in um, what, what I refer to as um, illicit activities. Um, but what's the role for young people in silencing the guns? Um, in the past two years, uh, myself and my team, the Youth for Peace Africa program, as well as everyone I recognize on this platform, Graham Inclusive, has played a role in what has become uh, the, 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 what the PSC has uh, endorsed as the role and contributions of youth to peace and security. And I think through that study, we, we went to all the regions of Africa, all five of them. We got views from the diaspora. And it's amazing, you know, it's amazing what young people are doing within what they refer to as a restricted space, a space where they feel unsafe, a space where their challenges, you know, everyday challenges, electricity, water, road networks and so on and so forth, where there are, you know, other challenges in terms of financing, in terms of um, um, uh, spaces for collaboration and engagement. To imagine that young African women and men have achieved what they have as contained in that study, it blows my mind to say the least. If they're able to do that, What's more, now that we have these three resolutions from the United Nations, the African Youth Charter, 
And then more recently, the Continental Framework on Youth, Peace and Security. Now, the one thing I'd like to do at this point is to tell young people, do not see these normative frameworks, even though they come from different institutions, do not see them as standalones. They are derived and derivable from the whole. What is the common goal of all these uh, uh, documents? To ensure the advancement of YPS, protection of those in it, um, adv advance their, 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 their skills, knowledge, capacities, and whatnot. There is a common thread that runs through all these documents and a common purpose. So what I'm saying in essence is even though they are different institutions, the purpose remains the same. And if young people can take advantage of the provisions of these normative frameworks, I can, it's only left to imagine how much further that YPS in Africa will go. However, I think there is something that underlies that purpose that we need to pay a bit more attention to. And that is being in a position to enable young peace builders themselves. I'm glad that Apeleke went through um, his presentation and enriched a number of issues and things. But the one I find most useful and I've continued to reflect and um, pause it at uh, uh, spaces like this is the essence of peer to peer interaction and collaboration. There is nothing that, in my view, beats the ability for people who share a common goal, have common experiences, common challenges to sit down and have a discussion on how they can work better. I think it's a mistake that is often made when we engage young people and we refer to it as capacity building. Young people have capacities. Yes, the capacities may be enhanced, but it's not to assume that they have the rest of capacity. I think young people, in individuals and networks should begin to figure out ways to work closer and use their comparative advantage in ways that makes them more effective, more sustainable, and above all, accountable to themselves. I think with these three elements, we'll figure out that young people are not only able to do more in the space of peace and security, and by that token, contributing to SDG, but over and above that, we'll be creating the space for other initiatives that derive from a peaceful and stable environment from taking off. And by this, I mean, again, I refer to the um, AFCFT as an example. There are several others if we look at the uh, priorities of um, Agenda 2063, like I said, there are 15 of them. Um, so in conclusion, I think Young people are knowledgeable, they are resilient and extremely so, and working with policymakers, I think would be my concluding point, working with policymakers, institutions such as your governments, uh, uh, RECs and the AU is important. Um, if Christian is back on, I'm sure he can share his experience from the first briefing um, to the Peace and Security, uh, African Union Peace and Security Council. And the way the interaction between those of us within the organization were able to advise and guide, not just the presentation that was made to the PSC, but also other engagements with stakeholders within that space on how to ensure that the end goals are achieved. Sometimes it's not by carrying placards, it's not by using 
um, uh, language, inappropriate language. Um, but you need to, in a sense, know the rules of the game to play the game and win. And I think this is really important. And I am so proud that the collaboration that the uh, Youth for Peace Africa program has had with young peace builders across the continent is yielding results, as we can see with the study and the continental framework. Um, but we are confident that there's more to be done. And uh, we're in several collaborations with different organizations, uh, youth organizations, to achieve um, different uh, aspects of uh, peace building, but I think we have a joint responsibility as policymakers and as youth peace builders to ensure that the spaces, and I like actually Ak case reference to uh, law abiding and rule of law, that the right steps are engaged in the right spaces to achieve um, the desired uh, effects we want to achieve in terms of the youth peace and security agenda on the continent. Uh, I think I'll stop here and then we'll take uh, further issues in uh, what I assume will be a question and answer session. Uh, right. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Roots. Uh, I guess we have Achaleke back in the house. Uh, just a quick recap of some of the things that Dr. Roops um, already said. Um, the Silencing the Guns campaign, um, as, as we all know, uh, is part of African Union's uh, plan to achieving the Agenda 2063, uh, which has been designed uh, for, the, for, 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 for the continent. And basically, when you look at I mean, the Silencing the Guns uh, uh, document, it basically highlights um, four important ways by which the African Union aims to silence the gun uh, before 2020. And the first one, it talks about the, 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 the idea of tackling the proliferation of small and light weapons, um, how we can promote reconciliation and social, uh, social cohesion among ourselves, how we can prevent illicit resource outflows and strengthening the various security and defense institutions um, on the continent. But for, for some of us, we have done uh, some kind of critique of the silencing the guns um, uh, in Africa initiative. Uh, and we know that uh, Whatever initiative that is coming from the African Union, you know, of, of course, factor the potentials and contributions of young people. Um, as it, the African Union also recognized that, I mean, uh, young people represent the greatest resource uh, that is existing in this continent, far, far beyond oil, far, far beyond gold, I mean, and other material uh, thing that we have. So I think that the contributions of young people in achieving the silencing the gun campaign is very, very critical. But of course, that is not to say that. Uh, we must not address the structural issues hindering their participation uh, in peace and security. So it's on that note that I want to bring on board um, Graham Simpson to provide for us some kind of highlights from the progress study that was done uh, sometimes in, 2000 and, in 2018, where uh, they captured the various, I mean, uh, challenges, the various opportunities, the various potentials that the inclusion of young people holds uh, for peace and security. So, Graham, um, over to you now uh, in 10 minutes. Thanks again, and uh, thanks uh, so much for the opportunity to talk uh, with you all and listen. Um, for me, um, I, I just want to say getting up at 6 a.m. to do this is not a, is not a burden, actually quite the opposite. Um, this is my, I'm very grateful for the intravenous injection again, the plug in to my, directly into my political veins. Of the, of the youth voice and the access to young people, the privilege of my life was, uh, was being in a position on the Progress Study on Youth Peace and Security uh, to play a role in a facilitative process which actually gave young people a platform to be heard. And I really want to begin there because when we talk about the problems and the experiences of young people's exclusion and marginalization, uh, when we talk about how important it is to think about the relationship between young people's uh, everyday peace building practice and the innovation and creativity and resourcefulness and resilience of young people. And we, and we talk about, and, and I think uh, uh, the chair began by saying how grateful we should be for the, um, the policy frameworks provided by international organizations. Actually, I think it's the other way around. I think that the UN and the AU should be eternally grateful to young people 
I think it's young people who shaped and drove this agenda. I think it's young people who will, through their actions, move this from policy to implementation and delivery. And it's one thing to have these uh, amazing normative frameworks on the table, but unless young people are operationalizing them, are holding the governments and the international and multilateral systems to the fire, um, these things may look very good on paper. Uh, um, and they may even reflect young people's voice. But we have to look at how we move from, operate, from policy to operational uh, approaches. Um, and on this, in some ways, the African Union was the leader um, because, uh, you know, the African Charter in 2006, uh, which has incredibly progressive aspirational language, uh, preceded the, the progress study and the work that came uh, in the UN system in some ways by 10 years. In, you know, um, and we need to recognize that. But at the same time, we need to also acknowledge that it was a policy document that could easily sit on the shelf. They didn't get the attention it needed. They didn't get the drive and innovation that we've seen more recently through the establishment of uh, the Office of the African, Youth, uh, uh, African Union Youth Envoy, through the Silencing the Guns Initiative to try and make this more operational, however critical we might, we might be of that. Um, and I think the same is true in the UN. I mean, it was fascinating for me most recently to hear at uh, one of the most recent open debates, looking at one of the follow-up resolutions for the UN, um, to hear one of the young people saying, well, maybe we shouldn't be talking about a new resolution. Maybe we should be talking about the implementation of those that are already on the table. And 2250 has enormous opportunity, offers enormous opportunity. The progress study offers an amazing agenda in the voice of young people themselves for what implementing this should look like but we aren't doing enough. We aren't investing enough resources, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last thing I'll say on this point is that uh, there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of soul searching in the UN at the time that we were doing the progress study about how important it was, in, in quotes, that the UN didn't leave anyone behind, that the policy agenda didn't leave anyone behind. And actually what I kept saying to the, to the colleagues in the UN is that when we look at what young people are doing, when we listen effectively to what young people are engaged in in their peace building work every day, the real danger is that if the UN doesn't address the exclusion of 1.8 billion young people globally from its operational frameworks, then it is likely it will be young people who leave the multilateral system behind, not the other way around. So I really just want to emphasize this because I think that the the, if, there, if, there is, if there is one thing that was most clear about the progress study on youth peace and security, it was that it was an, enabled by a resolution 2250, which implicitly acknowledged the failings of the multilateral system in its inability to accommodate, listen, uh, provide the platforms for participation, um, and be shaped and driven by the work, innovation, creativity, and voice of young people themselves. Yeah? Um, and it was an attempt to address that deficit that is at the heart of the progress study. And the first battle that I fought inside that system in order to do this was a recognition of the fact that we couldn't talk about um, addressing the problems of youth exclusion um, uh, and then exclude young people from the process itself. And so the progress study, how it happened, is as almost as important as the recommendations it made. Um, that it was about uh, a collaboration of international organizations who had trust-based relationships with young people on the ground that enabled us to run 280 focus groups in 44 countries, that we were pushing the boundaries to say it's not good enough just to have regional consultations where we listen to the select handful of young people for the UN at that time, which is where I think their, their political will was. It is absolutely indispensable that what we do is we listen to young people who would not normally have a voice in these processes. And I want to emphasize this. We talked at the time, initially, about young people who are hard to reach. But young people in the progress study, in the process of the progress study, were very quick to say to us, we aren't hard to reach, just not very good at listening to us. And what that meant for us was that the critical issues we had to get access to young people whose voices would not normally be heard in these processes. And so what the progress study did remarkably was it accessed young people from the global north and the global south. It accessed young people across all the different regions and at the country level we produced. 35 country specific 
case studies for this. And in the focus groups, we heard young former combatants from uh, the, the, the Somalia. We heard those still engaged in, in combat in the Philippines. We heard young women in the foothills of the, of the, of the uh, Guatemala. We heard young uh, second generation forced migrants, young migrants in the suburbs of Stockholm. We listened to African-American youth fighting against gun violence in, in the south side of Chicago. And we learned dramatically when you talk, for example, about guns, that the voice of young African-Americans in the south side of Chicago and the voice of young uh, uh, men in South Sudan, when they spoke about guns, they had an incredibly common agenda, an incredibly common language. There was a universality to this agenda that became clear when we listened to young people. So this is the most important issue, is that it's young people who shape, drive, and, and keep this uh, agenda animated and are going to move it beyond just a policy discourse into one which is about operations, funding, effective uh, work on that. Um, I'm going to try and be quick, but essentially uh, th there are a few things that I think become very clear. One of the things we recognized in the study was that it was often stereotypes about young people being a threat or young people being a problem that tended to skew both the funding and orientation of work around youth and conflict um, that it produced what we called a series of policy panics. That the stereotypes about young men with guns as a threat or young women as passive victims um, were really problematic stereotypes for young people. That young people were saying, these things deny our, our agency, our voice and our leadership as peace builders. They see us only as the problem. And in some ways this produced a policy panic that was very important because we still see it in much of the discourse around the youth peace and security agenda globally, we still see the dominant conversation often being about the role of young people who are going to be recruited into extremist armed groups. It's a tiny proportion of young people who are in that role. And yet we spend all of our resources on security-based measures, worrying about that small group of young people. No one's saying that it's not important. No one's saying that it's not, but it's disproportionately shaping this agenda and skewing the allocation of resources. It contributes to young people's exclusion. If we only invest in young people as a risk, rather than in the resourcefulness, innovation and creativity of young peace builders. This was absolutely critical. By the way, the other two arenas of policy panic that we identified was the very fact that the youth bulge, the growth of a youth population as a proportion of the population, particularly in the global south, in Africa, um, was often treated as a threat, that it young are growing. And again, there's just no evidence for that, that actually young people are very often innovators, creators, drivers of peace and doing this amazing work and we only look at them as a threat. The third area was in migration, forced migration and young migrants were often seen as bringing risk and bringing threat and actually if we look at the reality this defied the evidence which is that young people are often and, and migrant communities are often innovative in creating jobs and creating economic opportunity in providing alternative places of belonging for young people etc cetera, etc cetera. so these experiences of these stereotypes were at the heart of the exclusion and then what young people talked about and by the way i should also say it became very clear that this exclusion is also reflected in the data gaps that we've discovered when we talk to young people, that um, there's very little age and gender disaggregated data about this population in our societies. And this is a very big agenda concern, um, that if young people are absent from the data and from the in, remain invisible, then policy and resources are not allocated to address their needs and priorities. So it's very important that governments get this right get this right, understand its role in rendering young people invisible and therefore adding to their exclusion. What young people did so powerfully is they described what in their words were the violence of exclusion. And what they said is if you're trying to deal with violent extremism or if you're trying to deal with all of these patterns of conflict and violence, then the only way is to address the violence of young people's exclusion. If we address the violence of young people's exclusion, their structural violence of their exclusion, um, then we have a chance of preventing the violence of extremism. But it's about addressing the problem of exclusion rather than about addressing the problem of, ex of extremism itself. 
So what was this exclusion that young people described? Well, the most important thing is that they described it as intersectoral, as every dimension of their lives. So young people spoke very powerfully about their exclusion from political process. But they weren't just talking about formal politics, although that is very important. Um, they were also talking about all of the policy spaces that impact their lives, all of the conflict, and then are excluded from the peace process which attempt to address these problems. And it's very important that 2419, as a UN Security Council resolution, was actually responsive to that initiative. It was responsive to that concern. It's one of its core concerns was then to look at how to move the policy agenda forward, to respond to this demand by young people that they needed to be central to peace processes, not just because it was uh, desirable for them, but because the, the durability and the legitimacy of peace processes depended on the buy-in and the investment of young people as peace builders. Um, and so this is really important. So on the one hand, this was about political participation, political exclusion, and young people challenged us all the time. They said, we're not just looking for symbolic or tokenistic participation. Participation and inclusion has to be meaningful. And meaningful participation became a core messaging in the progress study because it was about how young people described what made participation and inclusion in all of the policy arenas that affect their lives meaningful. Beyond that, what young people were saying is this, this wasn't just about a trust deficit in their relationship with their governments politically or the multilateral system's failure to listen to them or empower them effectively. It was also about a loss of trust in economic systems that were not servicing young people. And so economic stake and participation, including jobs, but beyond just jobs, was seen as a critical part of addressing this pattern of exclusion. And the economic empowerment and participation of young people still needs a lot more attention in terms of uh, the, the youth peace and security agenda. Um, and their economic stake was critical to their notions of, of meaningful inclusion. Um, education, a critical issue that came up in every single consultation from the most local focus groups to the, to the, to the global networks, uh, where young people were saying education is a vital dimension of their participation and inclusion in society. And in addition, they said, you know, education is one of the places we meet our states most directly. That education is all about us, but we have no role in shaping the agenda, in defining the priorities. And that whenever conflict hits, one of the first places that suffers is young people's access to education, and we need to protect that space. And we see that again in the, all of these issues uh, manifest in the, in the current COVID pandemic, where what COVID has illustrated is all the arenas where young people are excluded are the arenas in which COVID once again triggers these patterns of exclusion um, uh, and where young people are trying to address this. Um, and we see, you know, one of the immediate consequences of COVID is the school shutting down. Um, in addition to this, young people talked about protection, um, uh, protection from uh, their violations, um, the, the physical dangers that peace builders and human rights defenders, young human rights defenders and peace builders faced but went beyond that, they talked about protection of the civic and political space in which they do their peace building. And this is amazing. This is one of the most incredible, again, young people forcing the policy agenda, one of the most important innovations in resolution 2535, the most recent resolution to come out of the UN Security Council, whether we can realize this aspiration or not remains to be seen, but that this resolution has language which talks explicitly for the first time, precedent setting language in the UN, about the protection of civic and political space. And that's absolutely indispensable because it's not about a human rights framework that is just about the physical dangers and violations of young people, although that's very important. It's also about the protection of their rights of participation and inclusion, their rights to peaceful protest and dissent, that these are critical dimensions of young people's change agency that needs to be recognized by the system if we truly to include them. And the last one I want to mention is the gender dimension to this, because it hasn't been mentioned yet, and it's really, really important, is that what we heard across the board is that gender is one of the vehicles through which young people are excluded, and we need to recognize the unique and distinct experience of young women. And in every single one of these spheres, whether it's in access to jobs, whether it's in political participation, whether it's about education, whether it's about uh, 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 
DDR and reintegration of former combatants, in every single one of these arenas, young women are disproportionately marginalized and excluded. And in addition to that, what young people spoke to us about and that really pushed this agenda even further was a recognition of the fact that we also need to address the, the concerns of uh, particular approaches to masculinity and notions of manhood that feed conflict, in, uh, cultivate uh, violence, et cetera, et cetera. So the gender agenda is both about the unique experiences of young women, but also addressing some of these problematic dimensions of masculinity as well. And this was seen as absolutely essential to young people's participation. I'm going to say two last things, um, and, I, and I'm mindful of my time. The first is that um, in the antidote to this, to all of this, is the section in the progress study which looks at the resourcefulness, resilience, innovation, and creativity of young people. Because if we want to see what the antidote to exclusion is, what young people's participation and inclusion is, all we have to do is listen to all of the ways in which they innovate. Young people are working across different regions at the local level, right through to the global level uh, networks. Young people are working across different phases of co conflict. When we talk about stopping the guns, young people have recognized, fundamental to the sustaining peace agenda, that uh, their participation as peace builders is not just in post-conflict situations or not just in live conflict situations, but the youth peace and security agenda is absolutely indispensable to prevention, to addressing the underlying causes, as Rooks uh, spoke about it, that this is vital uh, arena of young people's participation. Young people are working across different typologies of violence. They're dealing with violent crime, they're dealing with terrorism and, and uh, extremism, they're dealing with gender-based violence, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, young people are working in unique and innovative partnerships in ways that are, you know, and this peer-to-peer -peer issue that, that Rooks mentioned, I want to reaffirm, because this is very often about how young people are learning from each other horizontally, that enablement, the youth networks that operate in the peace building sphere are absolutely critical. And so at the end of the day, if we want to talk about how we translate um, young people's innovation and creativity, their resourcefulness and resilience, this alternative space for investment in young people's uh, peace building activity, if we want to translate that into a peace the, or the, the, or the saying means we have to invest in young people's resourcefulness, their peace building and their resilience. And that's funding and platforms for young people. And it's about recognizing that often young people are saying, this is not about inviting us to sit at your table. It's recognizing we have set our own tables. Come and listen to us. Look at what we are doing. Reinvest in it. This is how you address youth exclusion. This is how you translate a demographic dividend into a peace dividend for the whole world. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Graham, uh, for providing us that very amazing recommendations. And I'm sure that uh, the African Union representative, I mean, uh, heard all that you said, uh, all other, I mean, top organizations here, uh, members of government agencies and ministries who are attending this call have also noted down all that you have uh, rightly mentioned. I, I see that Graham mentioned quite a, a, a number of things if in terms of transforming the exclusionary realities of young people into peace dividends. He talked about uh, the meaningful uh, participation and inclusion of young people in peace processes. I mean, not just uh, I mean, uh, not just our inclusion in peace processes, but I mean, we must be meaningfully engaged um, in the processes going forward. Uh, Graham talked about economic empowerment and inclusion of young people beyond jobs, beyond, I mean, unnecessary tokenism. We want, I mean, the right atmosphere for us to be able to uh, push our aspirations. We want the right atmosphere for us to be able to manifest our work. And I think that it's an area that uh, government must concretely uh, look into. Graham also emphasized the need for the protection of, of civic space. I think this is something that is also critical. If we're talking about silencing the guns uh, in 2020 and, and beyond, the experiences that we're getting from Nigeria uh, is not encouraging at all. There are so many civil society regulations 
that are coming on board now, which will, um, in the long run, hinder our participation and contributions uh, to sustainable peace and, and development in Nigeria. You know, now there is a law against uh, against hate speech, which, which states that uh, once you uh, criticize government illegally, you 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 be mandated to pay about five million naira, uh, no matter whose ox is uh, whose ox is got. I mean, so these are some of the interesting things that I think that we need to inculcate if we are serious about silencing the guns. Economic empowerment is key. Meaningful inclusion of young people is key. Uh, protection of civic space is also key then. Uh, Graham also talked about uh, the important role of education in all of this. Uh, so before we move to our Q&A session, I want to seek your indulgence to uh, allow us to take uh, a minute or two minute break. Uh, let's just uh, use that period to take our group photograph before we return to all our speakers and our participants for a brief Q&A. A COVID-19 cannot stop us from taking our, our group photograph. So uh, panelists, participants, kindly put on your camera for a brief uh, time so we can take our group photograph. Thank you so much. Andre, Yusuf, Stephanie, it's been an amazing session so far. I know all of you have, I mean, loads of questions for our speakers. Just put on your camera, let's just take group photograph, at least to keep the memory of this conversation. All right, Daniel, can you put on your camera? Is it possible? Audrey, is it possible? Spoda, Toluani, Helen, is it possible? Can you put on your camera? Oh, great. Great. We're almost there. Stephanie, Ellen, Martin, Audrey. Oh, great. Great. Come in. Let's smile a little bit. Let's smile. I'm, I can see frown faces. Let's smile a little bit. <laughs> All right, great. I think we have uh, we have the photograph now, um, so we can put on our okay. We can put off our cameras if we desire. Uh, there are a lot of questions already popping up that I want our speakers to also uh, likely take us through. I'm sure that uh, from what we have heard so far, um, personally, it is my conclusion that we cannot talk about silencing the guns in Africa without talking about silencing the violence of exclusion that young people are faced with. And I think that Graham rightly uh, pointed that out. The question about young people's unemployment in Africa is something that is giving um, every one of us uh, Concern the question about, I mean, protection of youth peace builders, protection of young people is also something that is giving us concern. Protection of civic space uh, is these are things that we must, I mean, uh, begin to look into if we are serious about silencing the guns. And, and, and I'm happy that uh, the African Union is coming up with mechanisms and initiatives uh, towards addressing towards addressing all these things. But the reality again is that uh, we have seen some some of the initiatives from the African Union. Uh, tending to be to, 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 to be reactionary, I mean, rather than a pre preventive. And I'm sure that uh, Dr. Rooks will, I mean, uh, talk more on some of these things. We have a couple of questions for you. Uh, somebody asked in the group whether you see any condition for silencing the guns in Africa at the moment with the realities again of the coup um, in Mali, ongoing conflicts in Nigeria, ongoing conflict in Burkina Faso, in Cameroon, and other places. Do you see the conditions for silencing the guns um, on the continent? Uh, then to Achaleke, somebody asked, um, I think your colleague from Cameroon was asking whether you can cite examples of capacity building activities that has been successful and in your own context. Uh, as Achaleke will respond to this, I would also like you to take, I mean, some time to also explain to participants on this call 
some of the things that you are doing in terms of uh, the prison pre, prison prisoner projects um, in Cameroon, how you are working with prisoners, how you are empowering them, giving them vocational skills, and preparing them for reintegration back into the society. I would like you to also, I mean, share some some insight into this interesting project that you are doing in you are doing in Cameroon. Uh, then somebody also asks again, I think to to Dr. Rooks, what are the existing um, training opportunities for young peace builders? even from the African Union Commission. If there are, are some, you can also uh, share with participants they, will, they would like to hear. So um, let, me, let, me take, uh, let me take Achaleke first. Achaleke, are you here? Can you respond to the questions? Yes, I, uh, I would like to respond. And um, you know, based on the question of some successful capacity building programs, I, I should say that there's a plethora of them. There's a lot that has been going on that young people have been leading, that international organizations have been leading or have been working in collaboration. I, I take, for example, uh, UNESCO for over a, a year plus now has been working on something called the UNESCO Peace Ambassadors where you know trainings are provided to, uh, a TOT training, trainer trainers are provided to groups of young people then they are provided with resources and opportunity to do restitution. Now, this is part of the PBSO funding, uh, the, the UN Peace Building uh, Fund. And I have been uh, um, seriously engaged in this process to ensure that it's, uh, it's a process driven by young people. Because at, at this time, as a young peace builder, I focus a lot around moderating and ensuring that you know, young people's views and perspective are effectively articulated in the design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of these programs. I think that's one thing which is important. It's not just about the capacity building. It's about how the design was done. And then that's an example. At the level of the organization where I lead and you know the different networks which I'm part of nationally, we are currently uh, 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 you know, trying to look at how to expand uh, the, the, the network of young mediators, which was a recommendation made in the UN Security Council Resolution 2419, and even the progress study looked at options of this nature. Even the African Union looked at this. So we told us that rather than sitting and waiting that you know the same people who have given us policy comes to help us implement, we need to start implementing. That's one thing that young people need to bring as their own quota. I mean, that's one thing I've learned. You talked about awards. We don't win awards because we just talk. It's because of teamwork. It's because of working. It's because of doing things which are palpable, tangible, that you can touch, you can feel. So the whole issue of capacity building, we had the national symposium. But before the national symposium, there was a pre-workshop, which we are still lobbying for resources to see how we could do this yearly. There was a pre-workshop where 30 young people were trained. And from the 30 young people, they came to the national symposium. And from the national symposium, 17 out of the 30 were selected to form the first cohort. The fact that there was a selection process comes back to remind us that, that you know, there needs to be a selected few who have demonstrated track record leadership and that can mentor others and lead towards having a bigger change. That is one thing which is very important. And now coming to the conversation around you know, our work in prison. I mean, this is very um, uh, interesting because it's something which from the beginning we faced a lot of roadblock. Having access to work in prison is not a day's job. It took us one year you know, to get access to work in prison. And we are an organization we've been existing for a long time. We have track record. But prisons have its challenges. People go to prison, what they see is taking pictures of how people are overcrowded and start blasting. To me, as a peace builder and to our institution, we look at these realities and how can we solve? I grew up in a community where violence was the order of day. I live violence, I saw violence, I know how it looks like. But I realized that most of my friends who were thrown to jail only came out from prison to become worst. It showed that I instead decided to mobilize my peers for us to start up a movement which is called the prisonpreneurship. Today, it's been referenced all over, even in the UN Security Council, because we decided as young people to change the narrative Rather than being the blame game leaders, we have to be the solution provider leaders. And today, this initiative for the past three, four years has been able to provide alternative to violence to young people in prisons who have committed violence of different sorts, including even people who have been involved in violent extremism, where we train them in vocational skills 
We train them on entrepreneurship development. We bring aspects of peace building, civic education, personality development, and psychosocial support to them. Now, from the beginning, even the stakeholders providing resources for this asked us, told us, Christian, we are not sure it's possible for a young person who has committed crime to you know, stay out of crime. I said, no, my life is an, is an example. Many young people I've met with would have seen. Many of them will not tell you their story, but it is possible to transform. Today, as we speak, we have had five international exhibitions with the products which they produce. If you see the clothes they produce, the shoes, they produce slippers out of tires. They are even helping to prevent, you know, to fight against climate change by transforming used tires into slippers. Today, prisonpreneurship, these young people have been talked on BBC, on Al Jazeera, across the world, because we were able to give them an opportunity. And we have practical examples of people who have left prison. Let me give you an example, one of them, Michael. Michael is a young person who was incarcerated for 135 years in prison. I met him in 2016, and we started working with him. We trained him, and as time went on, he kept doing appeals for his case, and the years were being curbed as time was going on. And continuously, he demonstrated leadership learning. He was into beats production, producing a bag and clothes in prison with his team. Gradually, he became the class prefect of that training session. And with time, he became so resourceful to an extent where he could even generate income while in prison, buying his own machine in prison. Today, as we speak, Michael was recently released after 16 years now, from 135 to 16 years because of his transformation while in prison. Michael is out of prison. We have worked with him and we have already set up his own enterprise and he has transformed it into a vocational center where he's currently receiving inmates who leave prison and he's training them. If you see his products, you'll be wild. Amidst COVID, Michael took upon himself to work with us to produce face masks to give to prisons for free and went to prisons across the country training inmates on how to produce face masks to prevent themselves from the pandemic. Now, this is a young man who is not just providing this you know, support, but it's changing the narrative that we need to be solution providers, that we need to build resilience. Inmates need to be able to provide the solutions for themselves. And today, this initiative is ongoing. As we speak, there's so much work happening. Many people want to engage. The funding for it had ended. But our passion, our vision, our drive, and the need to be solution providers is keeping this project living. And government today, for the first time in 2019, launched the, Interna the National Youth Day in prison for the first time in history. This is to tell you that we are using evidence-based advocacy tools to push government to take action, to push international organizations to take action, and to remind you that even during the process in 2015, when we were advocating for the UN Security Council Resolution on Youth Peace and Security, when we were in New York talking to stakeholders, we were not talking to them from textbooks. We we're talking to them from practice, from evidence, from groundwork to say that young people are ambassadors of peace and change are not agents of violence as we have been seen. And for us to change that, we need palpable examples. We need real-time, life-changing, examples of the work that we do as young people. And I want to encourage us all to know that we can only change narrative if we are concrete, if we respect the rule of law, if we ensure that we collaborate and rely on mentorship because it's very important to get this, this going. When you do this, trust me, you're gonna see government rushing behind you. You're gonna see international organization wanting to align with your work and wanting to support you because they believe in collaboration, they believe in partnership. So, I mean, this is, this, these are just my thoughts. And of course, if there are other questions, I'll be able to take them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Achaleke. Achaleke is an amazing peace builder to, uh, to listen to. Um, Dr. Rooks, are you still here? I am with you. All right, do you want to quickly uh, provide some kind of responses to the questions raised to you? Of course. Um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, with regards, uh, there was a question on what um, the AU is doing with regards um, 
training um, of uh, young uh, people uh, across the continent. Uh, but before I go into that, I think what is also important to, 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 to take on from Acheleke is what he refers to as a transformation process. And this is to say that transformations take place across different spaces. Acheleke has succeeded in transforming, you know, prisoners who ordinarily would look at as, you know, the dregs of society. We've lost hope. They can't get jobs. They can't sustain themselves. And then what becomes of them? They come out of prison and then they become, if you like, um, um, first-hand threats to society, okay? But this is a transformation. Now, let's take that and pack that um, for a moment and look at other transformations that are taking place within the policy uh, arena. What was the perception of policymakers to young people? Graham has alluded to that. They were seen primarily as troublemakers. And, you know, if you, look, if, if you thought of who a terrorist uh, was, you know, a couple of years ago, maybe it's changing now. The picture that would come to your mind would be a young man with uh, a gun and, you know, bullets uh, across his shoulder. And then if you thought of picturing uh, the victims, you would see, you know, in a, a, a young woman. Okay. Now, what am I trying to say here? The same transformation is taking place within the policy space. Up till about two and a half years ago, the perception of the policymakers at the continental level, at least I can speak to that, of young people was trouble. But right now I can tell you, and it's not a matter of me saying, but you can also pick up several PSC communiques and um, uh, communiques from uh, the assembly of heads of state meetings, uh, you know, where the role of young people are being increasingly recognized, not simply as peace builders, but stakeholders in the journey of uh, the continent from its current state to an Africa we want, one that is driven by peace and development. So what I'm saying to you now is we have to also take it upon ourselves and when I say we, I am saying young people and those of us who work within policy spaces to work together to ensure that all the positive things that have been derived in the past few years, okay? And Graham said so. The African Charter came way before the UN Security Council resolutions, all right? But nothing significant happened. But now there has been tremendous steps taken and we must not lose that momentum. We must continue to figure out ways of transforming the YPS agenda in Africa to ensure that we keep building on these achievements and getting where we need to be. If we have gone from a position where young people were considered by our governments and policymakers as trouble, and they are now seen as partners, I think in the last two and a half years, there has been considerable progress. If within two and a half years, the AU Peace and Security Council has decided that there will be an annual session dedicated solely to youth peace and security. I think we're going somewhere. And let me also tell you that this year, there will be two sessions because we had one a couple months ago when uh, the two documents, the study and the framework were uh, adopted by the PSC and there will still be one in November. So, in terms of transformation, let us look at these issues. And these are, if you like, baby steps towards silencing the guns. So if you see what I'm trying to do here is trying to highlight the role that young people themselves have to play in silencing the guns. Yes, there are active guns in terms of wars, conflicts across Africa. But like I said, the whole notion of silencing the guns is not limited to active violent conflict. It's about addressing also, also addressing the structural root causes of conflict. And one of those things that are, have been identified is the lack of economic sustaining opportunities for young people. All right. So what Acheleke has done, in a sense, is to take a segment of society that would have put the bigger society at risk and transformed them. What the Youth for Peace Africa team 
is doing within the policy space is changing the narrative of the way policymakers view young people and ensuring that policy begins to recognize their positive roles and contributions and brings them on board to ensure that they are partners, not beneficiaries, partners in that process. So when I hear the question, is silencing the guns achievable? I will answer with a resounding yes, but with a caveat that the responsibility is not solely on active conflict being resolved by governments, but also young people to continue to play their roles in ensuring that they're able to address the root causes. And when I say address, I mean complement the effort. So it's not their responsibility, but they are also able to play their roles in addressing, in recognizing, addressing, and combating the root causes of these conflicts, playing their roles in mediation to resolve some of these conflicts. And this is what the UN uh, Security Council resolutions all, are all about, as well as the AU continental framework. So what I'm saying is, it is a joint responsibility and we have to play our different parts. And this is by no means, please, I want to get this straight. This is by no means taking away the responsibility that is on governments and active participants and collaborators in these conflicts. What I am addressing here is the possibilities that exist within the, the situation we find ourselves and how we can contribute to silencing the guns. But let me reemphasize once again, silencing the guns is not simply about active conflict. It is also about addressing the root causes of conflict. So in your different spaces, if you are carrying out economic activities, and we saw this by bringing young people to farm as a collective, and they are gainfully employed, and they derive the economic sustenance from that economic activity, you have contributed in your own small means by ensuring that that category of people are not um, taken from the other side. And there's an example of this um, that we saw uh, uh, in Abuja very quickly. Young lady had a honey farm, she had her bees and so on and so forth, went to the farm one day, destroyed. The place had been set on fire. What's going on? Oh, the young people were identified and they said, look, we were hungry. We didn't have anything to eat. And you know, we, we know you come here to make money. So we, we thought we should while you were away. What did she do? Rather than get the police, which may have started a conflict from that community and herself and her business, she said, you know what? Come on board. I will teach you how to farm honey. Now, she has brought them on board now, this is already a group that had shown tendencies of violence simply to feed. But now you have brought them on board and said, I will teach you how to farm honey. What have you done? You have contributed in your own little way, however little, of contributing to silencing the guns. So what I'm saying is there are different levels at which we can make our contributions. The government has their responsibilities, institutions such as the UN, the AU, Rex have their responsibilities, but we as young peace builders, and yes, I am aligning with young peace builders, have our roles to play and indeed um, we should. I know there was a question on, on training. One of the very, very basic foundations that we decided intentionally to to, to, to found the Youth for Peace Africa program on was that it will not be a usual um, intergovernmental organization uh, program where the decisions are made and they are taken to initiate. Rather, we went, and for those who were in the meeting in Lagos in uh, September 2018, I think it was, 20, no, no, 20, 2017, we sat down and young people said, these are the main challenges we face. These are the places 
situations where we most need help. And based on that, we went back and drew up a plan of action. One of the key things we found out that was needed, training. Uh, seen opportunities. Uh, we, we've done that with the Swedish Embassy, for example, where, we, where uh, young people were, were um, encouraged to apply and get in touch with us. We had negotiated um, spaces for uh, members of the network. Um, some have gone to the Kofi Annan uh, uh, Center in, in Accra for training. Uh, some have gained immensely from in-house trainings. For example, one of the things we did while we were doing the regional consultation on the study was to have um, all participants go through some uh, uh, training, capacity building exercise. And uh, some of them were done with uh, our partner, uh, the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights. Um, others were done with uh, different partners. That I think one of them was with um, um, ISS. So what we did was to ensure that any time we bring young peace builders together, it's not solely to have, quote unquote, a meeting, but to also ensure that at the time they are leaving, they have also gained something that is really um, contributing to their knowledge. And examples of trainings we've done in this regard is um, take, taking them through the normative framework of um, uh, the UN and the AU uh, on, on YPES. We've done training severally on APSA, the, 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 the peace and security architecture of, of, of the union. And, uh, but for COVID, this year we, we had also set out a plan of several um, regional training exercises to take place and some um, that were dedicated on, on, on certain uh, uh, themes. Uh, but even within the COVID period, we've also done some training, uh, some dedicated to the Africa Youth Ambassadors for Peace, and some have been open uh, to uh, the general public, including one on project management. And this was from the gap we identified that youth networks are not able to adequately capture what they do, what they need, what they will achieve, you know, those necessary things to attract the sort of partnership and resource mobilization, not funding, resource mobilization that they need to ensure that their activities are carried out. So these are some of the things uh, that the Youth for Peace Africa program has done uh, with regards to uh, training uh, opportunities. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rooks. Uh, we're running out of time now. Thank you for the insights that you've shared. I am sure that uh, the actual person who asked that question is satisfied with your response. I uh, would like to go over to Graham now to just give us his closing remarks and um, especially his final charge for young peace builders on the continent as we continue to work towards strengthening the YPS architecture and agenda um, on the continent. Your final remarks, Graham. Um, so two things. Um, uh, the one is just an illustration. Um, I remember sitting in the in one of the regional consultations organised as part of the progress study for southern and uh, southern Africa and the Horn, um, and it was already uncomfortable that we were trying to um, uh, narrow this because there, there weren't enough resources. So we, but there was an amazing small group discussion in which we had a young person. Um, from Rwanda, a young person from Somalia, a young person from South Africa, uh, um, some from South Sudan, uh, and, and two young people from Botswana and Malawi. And it was amazing to watch that group have a conversation about a topic where essentially what happened was there was a bilateral conversation that took place between the young person from South Sudan, the young person from Somalia, where they were talking at the time about how their peace building work and how their youth peace and security engagement revolved around situations of live and ongoing conflict and they needed to navigate this with very limited space within very creative responses to that uh, situation. Um, the second conversation was, uh, was almost between a, a young South African woman and a young uh, Rwandan where the conversation was very much about saying, well, in situations where we've emerged from a history of conflict, but where most of the structural underpinnings have not been adequately resolved. 
we are still wrestling with this in particular ways. And there was a, it was a very different conversation because it was an understanding of a different point of interaction and engagement. And the third conversation was young people from Botswana and Malawi said, we need to understand what the root causes of this are because of where this could go in our societies and how, although they, these are relatively peaceful societies by comparison to some of the others, we still need to engage in the um, preemptive engagements and the prevention approaches and the harnessing of young people. This is really instructive because what it demonstrates for us is the diversity of young people's engagement across different phases of conflict in different contexts. It demonstrates the power of learning horizontally between young people who are engaged in these situations that are comparable and also recognizing where they are distinct and where they are different. Um, and so this is really, for me, very instructive. The second issue uh, I wanted to raise is that what young people were saying to us all the time is don't ghettoize us. Don't treat us just, uh, you know, we're, we're not just, uh, you, you can't just deal with us in ministries of culture or in ministries of sport. Um, that our, our exclusion and therefore our inclusion has to be holistic and comprehensive. And what that does is it produce, presents a real challenge both to the multilateral system and to governments to think about youth peace and security as a whole of system approach, as one which connects the dots between the different arenas of young people's participation and inclusion, um, political, economic, educational, gender-based approaches, um, et cetera. And, 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 and this is really important. Young people are saying to us, we aren't just about education or about jobs. Every SDG is a youth SDG. Everyone needs to have associated with it youth-oriented approaches, et cetera, et cetera, so that when we talk about building peace that is durable, we're recognizing it as a systemic approach. Yeah? And I think this is a really important issue. I think that young people have to broaden the network. We have to incorporate, and in every consultation we were in, young people in the room were saying, we need to get to the young people who are outside of the room. We need to get to those who are more marginal and more remote. We need to build our networks in a way that is intersectional because our lived experience of politics, of identity, of exclusion, and of political, of peace building is an intersectional one. It's a comprehensive approach. This is not an academic language. This is about the lived experience of young people as holistic. And I think what this does is it opens up very diverse platforms for young people to demonstrate their contribution, for them to pressure their governments to work in more uh, inter inter intersectional ways across the, the spectrum, to push the multilateral system to be doing this. And I think we can see the seeds of it in Resolution 2535 in the UN. One of the things that's really important is that starting to talk about a system-wide approach. Can the UN actually, this huge tanker, can we turn around the way it traditionally does things, the way in which it works in silos? Can we uh, get it to reflect more the intersectional lived experience of young people? That's still a challenge. But I think this is a space that young people can occupy in order to drive this agenda forward. Because then we'll start thinking about implementation, not in one small policy arena, not just in the space of the Security Council, because that really is dealing with very particular approaches to conflict. Um, but when we talk about silencing the guns more generally, we start to think about it in this diversified way, in this way that recognizes the connection between young people and durable peace as being on all of these different platforms and the, inter the, sort of, uh, the, 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 the whole of system approach. I really think young people need to keep pushing this and shaping that agenda. I think it would reflect the innovation and creativity that we discovered when we in chapter in the chapter that's on this in the progress study, and that I know was in the the inspiration in the AU study as well, that this is where young people's voice and vision and innovation and creativity is not seen as a threat, but is seen as an asset by the governments. Thank you so much, Graham, for that um, interesting insights. I'm very sure that all young peace builders on this call today must have noted all that you have said. My notes are already full. And of course, I'm going to begin to interrogate all that you have said uh, one after the other after this, after this conversation. I think that one interesting thing that Graham mentioned that stands out for me uh, was the fact that all that we've seen in recent times, especially at the United Nations and African Union level, 
uh, those things necessarily do not uh, generate from those institutions. But of course, there are efforts, uh, they are part of effort and struggles uh, of young people. Young people actually came up with the framework and handed it over to the UN uh, and to the AU. And Graham mentioned something that is, that is very significant that I think that uh, we all must hold on to. Uh, he mentioned the fact that if the multilateral system do not rise up to addressing some of the issues confronting young people at the moment, young people will be forced to leave the multilateral institutions behind. And this is, this, this is something that calls for sober reflection. And I think that we all must uh, see how we can, I mean, begin to rise up, rise up to the challenges. Uh, it's on that note that I want to, uh, on behalf of Building Blocks of Peace Foundation, thank all our uh, distinguished speakers who have honored us today. Uh, for coming to coming to join this conversation. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your contributions. Uh, we do not take them for granted. We hope that going forward, we can always, I mean, return back to you uh, for guidance, for advice, suggestions, as regards how we can strengthen the YPS agenda uh, in Africa. Uh, in the absence of any other question, I would like to seize this meeting and say that uh, we'll continue to engage with one another and we'll keep in touch. Bye. Thanks to all our participants for, for holding forth to buy. Thank you, Achaliki. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Rooks. Thanks to everyone. Lawal. Um, hello, hi. This is Sukanya Porter from King's College London. I know you guys oh. are closing. I might be a bit late asking this question. Can I just put oh. this question? Maybe we can follow up, please. Okay. So okay, I've been great. working on your security and you know youth conflict and ex-combatants for 15 years now across Africa and also in Asia. Graham, uh, I know of you through your work and through Saji Prelis with whom I have collaborated as well. Um, one of the things I find, um, you know, really liked all the stuff you said, but I wonder whether there is any thinking around how better or how best to link the formal efforts at a policy level with the informal efforts in, in the civic space. Because, you know, there is, <laughs> there is emphasis on, right, there's a lot of, lot of creativity, a lot of innovation, a lot of resilience, right? stuff going on in the civil society sector, which we are aware of, which you know, the multilateral organizations are aware of. But how do you link it better? And I find that quite a bit of a struggle, you know, my own work in West Africa, for example, in Liberia for many years. You know, there are so many institutions at an informal level uh, or organizations or peer networks, which are doing fascinating work, but they don't seem to link up with policy or government or, you know, how international actors or the UN or the African Union want to go about doing this. And I really think that it's not just about dialogue, it's about actually setting processes in place in which you can involve the informal into the formal. And I wonder whether there's any thinking around that, please. All right, uh, Graham, you want to quickly respond? Um, well, there's no, there's no magic. I mean, the one, the one thing I would say is that um, uh, I think that the, the evolution of young people's networks, which aggregate voice and which provide horizontal learning um, uh, and collaborative exchange between young people, I think that that has a cumulative effect. And I think it's, it's um, uh, we see this in the, in the, ability of a network like the United Network of Young Peace Builders, which is not the only, but a very important youth network. I think what we start to do there is we start to see the way in which the collaborative endeavors and the networks can actually translate uh, into cumulative effect some of these innovations. But I do think some of this is about an investment path, and I don't just mean financial investment. Um, I'm, I think it's about the commitment to investing in the innovation, resourcefulness, and resilience of young people. And I think that there are some areas in which this plays out. I think um, the ways in which young people have occupied and reclaimed uh, uh, cyberspace and the social media environment, uh, the recognition of that both as a risk arena, but also as an innovative space for alternative youth voice. I think these are very powerful tools that young people have started to mobilize themselves. I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a blueprint. I think your question is a really important agenda setting one. 
Um, because I think what we need to do is we need to explore more creatively. I mean, you know, we, we were so proud um, uh, of the fact that, you know, we made, a, we made a promise in the progress study to young people that if they didn't hear and see themselves in what we present to the Security Council, then we had failed. Um, and it was, it was by no means comprehensive. We scratched the surface of the unbelievable innovation and creativity of young people around the world. Um, uh, but at the same time, what we were able to do is we were able to capture in a small way just this, this sense of innovation, of creativity, of the space that young people... I think much more time and investment has to be put into that so that we start documenting building the compendium of innovative responses of young people in the space so that it becomes a learning tool for other young people and so that this aggregates the voice and amplifies the voice of young people in the policy space because we can demonstrate uh, illustrative examples and, and practices. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the how, it still begs the question of, of how most, uh, most effectively to do that. And, uh, thank you very much, Graham, for that uh, response. And thank you, Spoda, <laughs> for the quick question. I think we have to um, allow uh, our speakers go now. I know Graham has another meeting uh, in the next uh, two hours, the <laughs> Global IPS meeting. I know Dr. Rooks will also have to join the West Africa yeah. Silencing the Gun <laughs> Consultation taking place um, in the next few minutes. So uh, we'll continue this conversation later. Thank you so much for joining. We appreciate it. Thank you, Achaleke. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed. Yes, Poda, if you, if you can send an email, um, and then we, we can be in touch, and then we can continue yes. that uh, conversation. Yes, student, yeah. Prosperado works with you, probably. Prosper, who's with the you know, security stuff in Khartoum. He was in uh, Liberia for a long time. You know, he's just finished his PhD with me, but we'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure, sure. Likewise. Thank you, Graham. All right, bye. Talk to you soon. Thank you, bye.